Uh, it is. Big hand again is a little bit past the 12. So I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the Whitefish Planning Board, uh, April 20th, 2023. Um, and let's have a call to order. I'm sorry, a roll call, please, Kenny, for one last time, I understand. Here. Scott Friedenberger. Here. John Middleton. Here. Chris Gardner is absent. Allison Linville is absent. Steve Quinnell. Here. And Toby Scott. Here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the first item on the agenda is planning board appointment. Um, we need a, we need someone from the planning board to be rep to be a representative on the Lakeshore Committee. So I guess we, we can reappoint. I, I nominate you to be reappointed to that position. Okay. Any discussion? I didn't either. Uh, that's probably, eh, I'm not sure why, but it's on there. So uh, Every single year, it's an order of business that you have to reappoint that person. Every two years? Oh, every okay. two years. Okay. Usually we t handle that in January, though, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, those in favor of appointing Toby to the Lakeshore Committee, raise your hand. Like sign for against, and it passes unanimously. Um, did you raise your hand, Toby? Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is agenda changes. Are we going to change any order of the agenda tonight? Any suggestions from staff about changing anything? Okay, then we will move on to uh, approval of the minutes from the March 16th meeting. I'll move to approve. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion on that? Minutes from the 16th? Yeah. No. Okay. Those in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Um, the next item on the agenda is communications from the public for items not on the agenda. We did have to kind of adjourn our work session a little quickly there. So if you would like to have, uh, if you'd like to say anything about the uh, public engagement plan that we looked at for, at our work session, please feel free to come on up or for any other items that are not on the agenda tonight. Good evening, Mary Flowers, Citizens for a Better Flathead, 135 South Main Kalispell. And um, I'm not sure what happened if after everyone got in, those of us that were a little bit late got locked out, but uh, that was frustrating. Um, and so it would be nice to have been able to hear the presentation. Um, other than that, I would like to just reiterate that um, in my experience working with the public, um, while I think online tools are helpful, I think sitting across from each other talking and hearing different perspectives really helps to inform the public and for them to learn from each other. Um, and I hope that the process is um, heavy in direct public involvement where people can sit and talk and hear uh, presentations and then ask questions so that it's uh, not uh, overly reliant on uh, online uh, single individual responding to a survey or a question or making comments. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. I do think that uh, what came out was a pretty, um, pretty solid mix of in-person, not not totally, not. There's not going to be any sole reliance on the website. It appears a lot in the plan, but the plan, but the website is going to be kind of the. It's going to be there for all of the other pieces, even when we have in-person meetings. And I'm I'm pretty sure that we're going to have a good mix of that. In fact, I'm certain of it. Um, and then we do apologize. I guess there was a software update that, uh, as it was updating, they could not unlock the doors. Um, and so somehow it just happened to happen at 5.15 today. Um, 
and uh, just and just a reminder that the public engagement plan is online. Uh, the recording you can watch the recording from the presentation. You can always submit comments um, via email um, or during one of our regular sessions, uh, either of the planning board or the city council. So there are lots of avenues for for um, getting for taking for giving comment about um, what's what we're, what's upcoming. But right now. Uh, I think the one thing that maybe we need to just put out there is that the public engagement plan is just the first step, and because there is a pending pending legislation in the uh, state house, after we adopt our public engagement plan, the process might slow down because we might have to we don't want to do things that then have to be redone based on legislation that comes through this session. So um, that is that's one thing that came out in the earlier in our presentation as well. Okay, anybody else wish to speak on something that's not on the agenda tonight? Okay, we will um, move on to unfinished business of which there is none and start our public hearings. Our first hearing is WCZ 23-02, continued from the March Planning Board meeting, a request by the City of Whitefish for a zoning map amendment due to recent annexation. Um, and this one is Wendy. Good evening. Um, so I did update the staff report with just a little bit more information. Um, at the March 16th planning board meeting, um, you wanted to postpone this request um, because the WBT zone was about to become in effect. Um, so that has been attached to the packet as well as the WB2. Um, and then I also provided on page 26 of your packet a like comparison chart because there was questions about what's the difference between the WBT and the WB2 and you folks have not seen the WB2 with the exception of Steve for several, for I don't know a year probably by the time you know it left planning board and went to city council so there's kind of a list of the permitted and conditional uses and kind of how they compare um, just for your information. I also thought it might be kind of helpful just to understand the history of the zoning in that particular area. Um, when the county took the planning jurisdiction back, um, they rezoned it to a B2A, which was the county and a SAG-5 and an R2.5, which they had to create because they didn't have a zoning district like that. So their B2A was their closest comparable zone to RWB2. Um, we also were able to find, and I took a photo of it because it's just on this old cloth map down in the basement, um, a photo of the zoning back in 1982 which showed a WB2 along the front with a WA in the back. Um, in 2017, the neighbors out along the Highway 93 South Corridor, um, kind of from about the town pump south down past Blanchard Lake, uh, worked together with the county to do some rezoning out there. Um, they wanted to see a little bit more commercial options. I think it was all kind of like a SAG zone or an AG zone out there. Um, the city, during that process, the city was encouraging the use of their BSD, which was equivalent to our WBSD, along the highway corridor south of 40, because we didn't want to see retail expanded um, south of Highway 40. And 2017-ish is about the time uh, we started our Highway 93 corridor plan. Um, so what was ultimately approved by the county back in 2017 was a B4 with an HO, which is a highway overlay zoning district. And I just note that the B4 in the county is unique to just this area in Whitefish. It's not applied anywhere else. Um, it did include a list of expanded uses from the W or their B2A. Um, and so that's just a little bit of the background. Um, so the staff report, I just added the WBT stuff, like the purpose and intent, and a comparison of how it aligns with the B2 and the current B B4 zoning district. Um, so the remainder of the staff report is pretty much the same. We did um, put another notice in the pilot um, with the updated public information. Um, we did get an additional public comment after the public hearing last month clarifying the easement with the neighbor to the west. And there's a pretty substantial packet that I put in your packet. Um, and then an end, another additional comment supporting the WBT zoning district versus the WB2. Um, because, you know, we're not recommending, uh, we're still recommending the WB2 zoning district. Um, and, but we also um, 
offered some findings for you if you find that the WBT is more suitable for this area. So those are found on pages 12 through uh, the 15, yeah, 14. So we're recommending some amendments to finding 1, 7, and 10 if you want to do the WBT. Can I answer any questions for you? Questions for Wendy. Uh, I don't think I have any either, Wendy, thanks. Okay, so we will uh, open the public comment period and we will hear from the applicant. I saw Eric here, you wanna come up and, okay. Good evening, I think most of you were here last planning board meeting. Uh, I, I gave a pretty lengthy speech at that one, what, I, uh, what we had started with and the reason we were doing this. I won't go into all that this evening, but I do have a couple things I wanted to respond to from that meeting. But again, for anybody who wasn't here, we purchased this property several years ago, have invested a substantial amount of money into in the development st stage to this point. Uh, in any communication that I've had with any employee of the city planning department or anyone, uh, it has always been the exact same uh, zoning that I understood that this was zoned for or to be zoned for would be WB2, which has been there and, and as we all discussed, uh, was fought over all the way to the state Supreme Court for the city to control this property and it was at that time zoned by the city as WB2. So I'm not coming in here asking for a favor. I'm not asking for a variance. I'm not asking for anything outside the ordinary. I'm asking for purely the spirit in which this was proposed to the city roughly two years ago. Uh, during the height of COVID, most of it was on, on uh, online video calls, but was proposed to uh, create a corridor coming into Whitefish that was substantially different and improved than what is out there now. And I think everyone from the city council uh, and anyone who was involved in those discussions agreed that that was highly necessary. I proposed that this area and offering our property as a first example of that needed oversight simply by the experts, which are your planning department and the zoning laws that have been enacted over the years. At no point in those early stages were discussions ongoing about a new zoning on the north side of the, of the uh, intersection. There was a discussion partway through that process about a new zoning taking, uh, taking effect or being created, which at that point I don't think it was named WBT, but I really didn't pay any attention to it. And I really didn't attend many of the meetings, maybe one or two. I think we I attended one planning meeting in the room next door. And I offered pretty strong words that in that meeting that I felt it was, it, it had gone way beyond oversight and had become overreach. And that was not the purpose. And I was the first one who brought this to the city two year, two and a half year, two plus years ago in, in creating something that the city could be proud of, giving back to the city what they fought so hard to get 10, 15 years ago. You could correct me if I'm wrong, somewhere in that vicinity. Instead, it went from just a, a basic, let's, let's get control of this, let's try to put our heads and hands around this and control what is going in on there and don't let what is taking place in adjoining properties continue into this quarter, into Whitefish, it's not something any of us can be proud of. To a very limited public comment, I feel driving this WBT zoning to becoming so restrictive that I can't imagine anyone on those properties north, south of this junction having any desire to ask for annexation. And now we've gone opposite of what the whole goal of why we brought this property to you and why we joined some of the properties that uh, were bordering this property was trying to create a, a an epic build, an epic design to everything we do here that as you all pull up and everyone visitor that comes into Whitefish pulls up to this light 
and is looking directly at this property, the first thing they see if they're coming from the airport, from Glacier Park, from West, from Kalispell, is looking at this, these properties. And we've got now a, a proposed zoning which has already taken effect, unfortunately, and I think is gonna hinder the goal of what we, what we were all working towards. Councilor uh, Quinnell, you asked me why, why, do, why would I have a problem uh, with the WBT zoning? It just gives back to the city and to the, the, uh, the council and the planning board the ability to pick and choose a little bit more of what we get to use uh, this property for instead of WBT zoning, which a lot of uh, permitted uses don't need to be asked for in a conditional use permit. And I was not in a good position to answer that because I didn't feel at any point that this was gonna become an issue until we got to the last couple of meetings with uh, council <coughs> and with the planning board. So in the meantime, the last 30 days, I've spent some time associating myself with the WBT zoning a little bit more. So I'm not gonna take a lot of your time, but I'm just gonna read a few of the permitted uses that are in the WBT zoning that are not allowed in the WBT zoning, even under a conditional use permit. And if anyone who hears these would agree that these are not fitting for these properties and why I'm here asking you to put yourself in our position and why we asked for this be, to be annexed originally and the extension of services, if we would have known that this was gonna come up at this point, first of all, we would not have ever brought this to you. And that's an honest, from myself and my partner, honestly, we would not be standing here right now. We would be, there are a plethora of uses that the county zoning allows us to do here. We have a, a combined 12 acres. We have plenty of room for sanitation services to be able to still do multiple businesses on this property without having city services. I love working with this city. I live here. My office is on Central Avenue. My daughter goes to school a, a half a block away. I work with this planning department. I work with the building department. We greatly enjoy working with the city. We want to build something that represents everyone here on, the, on this particular parcel. I don't do a lot of development myself. I do most of it for clients. Uh, this is our, our personal project. I want to leave a legacy with this property that others, is, the other property owners up here can see what the potential is here, something that we can all be proud of. What, your, what WBT zoning would do is cripple th this property. This particular property is very unusual from the other properties in that we have the, the intersection. It completely changes this property's potential than a lot of the other properties south of the, um, of the light. If you read the intent and purpose of WB2 Secondary Business District, the district, it states clearly, this district depends on proximity to highways or arterial streets. That we couldn't be the epitome of that anymore if we tried. We have the busiest intersection in Whitefish. We have one of the busiest intersections in the entire county, and it directly dead ends into our property the potential for this property to help other properties become part of the city annexation and be utilized is unlimited. We cannot look at this property like any of the other properties out there. But let me just read a handful, and these are non-conditional use permit uses, and these would not be allowed to be applied for even under a conditional use permit on the WBT zoning. An antique store, an auction barn, automobile, boat, recreational vehicle, parts. Obviously, we would never want to do another boat dealership out there. Bed and breakfast, I won't read them all. I'm just reading the ones that make no sense to me that these would never be allowed to be even under a conditional use permit. Building supplies, entertainment uses, a farm and garden supply store. Can't be, can't be there. A financial institution, a grocery store, Household appliances, a laundry or a dry cleaning. Can't be there. Those are just some of the, there's a dozen more. There are a grand total of six uses under WBT that can be used without a conditional use permit. That is unfair, in my opinion. If, if that's what 
it's too obviously too late to change that on seven uses, but one is government buildings. The, uh, the properties to the south of that, this is something for them to deal with. I do not, and, and if it's placed on us, would we go through a de-annexation process, which I think the, in one of the, in the last council meeting, it, it was uh, discussed through uh, the city attorney, obviously it's an option. I don't, I would not saying we would do that, but I would be a, extremely discouraged that in my opinion, the spirit in which we all started this two years ago has changed to fit a, an agenda that is night and day opposite of what the 20 years of zoning were placed upon this property. So then we, we get into the only technicality that anyone could look at that I think we, we heard some comment on in the last two meetings was the parser. In fact, I think Councilor Quinnell, you brought this up and I, I made sure I got exact specifics for you on this for tonight, was the only portion of this property that is south of the light that even could be brought into a conversation of the WBT zoning that applies to properties to the south of the light is a very small sliver, which Carver Engineering created this for us, is this small sliver that, that has no, act, no frontage. These are the parcels that are been annexed. This represents 1.39 acres of uh, just under 12 acres, just under 12 acres. So uh, uh, if, if I would have known that this was going to become a technicality that could be, uh, that could affect the entire potential of this parcel, we would have simply carved that parcel off into a parcel four. We have three parcels here combining together to create this uh, plan. We, we would have just simply carved that off. The, it, it has very, the least use for us, the least potential for use. Uh, so really, there's, there's not up, a lot of upside to that. We would gladly still do that. This is the highway here. This is the highway frontage, our drainage swale. You come in the light here, and the new exit, the backage road will come across here. Would this parcel, would we like to keep it in there? Obviously, we would. But that is an option that we would be more than happy to consider. But really, I'm not, I'm, I'm forced to in my business to deal in facts. That's, we, can, we can't deal in emotion. It's, it's not uh, very advantageous from a business standpoint to, to deal in emotion, get upset about things. And we saw a couple new letters that have been sent in since the last hearing or the last meeting. And they're, in my opinion, they're, they're not, there's no facts, no fact-driven statistics or anything that would point to this property uh, being zone WBT would in any way impact anyone uh, that suggested that in, in letters. WB2 zoning, which is what we have always thought that this property would be zoned for, would offer it, it, just basically a support to downtown Whitefish. We're not trying to reinvent downtown Whitefish on 11 and a half acres. We're simply trying to give a little bit of support to a thousand whitefish residents that live on that side of town, they could be a laundry. They could have a vet. A, a vet could have a small building supply. Like there's a tremendous amount of businesses that could go in here that would have great impacts. The the traffic is not an issue, no matter what we would want to put here, because we have a traffic light. It would be all upside, but the put a crushing zoning on WBT on this property negates what everyone thought was gonna happen by bringing these properties by annexation and letting us have some potential here to create businesses that would support the residents on that side or someone pulling into Whitefish for the first time and wanting to simply buy a canoe or uh, a, a product for uh, working on their house, but uh, not going to be too specific. But the, the six uses that are s allowed under non-conditional use permit under WBT and then the conditional use permit, it is a drastic change from the WB2 zoning. So I'm not going to keep going on. I'm not going to get into too much about the, the letters that were sent in. Again, I'd say I, you have to look at facts. They re, I don't see any relevancy on anything we're discussing here tonight as far as zoning goes, but I'm happy to readdress any questions after all that's over, and I'm surely able to answer any questions you guys have for me about the parcels.
Thanks, Eric. Any questions for Eric? Okay, we might call you back up okay. later. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, anybody from the public wish to speak on this? Yep, come on up to the microphone. What's that? No, anybody would like to speak on this issue? My name is Tom Thomas. I live at 1000 Point of View Ranch Drive, Whitefish. I own Five Star Realty. <clears throat> I'm just going to go through some history because I moved here in 2000 and I've watched the escapades of this intersection for a long time. I've spoken out, uh, had the people for the donut work with us. Um, I was going to have somebody else come in, but his wife said she'd shoot him if he came back. Uh, he raised holy hell with you. But in 2008, after losing in court three times a lawsuit to retain jurisdiction within the two-mile radius, was given back to the county. Whitefish lost. 2009, uh, extension of services was first adopted for that area. When I say that area, I'm talking about 4093. Um, 2013, um, again, a ruling. Uh, and some of my dates may not be exact, but Flathead County took over the donut again. Flathead County adapted a, quor a quarter uh, plan, overlay zoning, properties south of 9043 in 2017. 2018, Whitefish Council takes up option to extend services south of 4093 to Blanchard Lake. You can tell how old you get when you realize how many things went by and you remember you were part of all of them and you remember them vividly. 2021, Whitefish holds a hearing on whether to allow sewer and water services south of 4093. That was three years later. January 2022, Whitefish plan on holding public hearings on Highway 40 annexation. January 22, lawsuit filed against the hotel owner who, or gentleman who wanted to put in a hotel. Whitefish won. The gentleman was legally in his rights. The zoning criteria was working for him. It's under appeal. November 22, Whitefish City Council realized it needs to take a closer look at the annexation policies before approving the transitional zoning district. Council, I guess, struggled on what to do with it. Um, I, I can echo much of what Mr. Payne just said. Um, as a realtor, I have had a number of restaurants and other businesses who wanted to come into Whitefish and either have said, that I'm not going to fight them, I'm not going to go be about it. Some of them opened up in um, Kalispell. Some very good businesses opened up in Kalispell that wanted to open up in Whitefish, but they weren't going to fight with you. <clears throat> and of course, a month ago, you kicked us down the road till tonight, and I don't know if you plan on kicking it down the road again. And just an, an, another little part of history, uh, we were the realtors that sold Town Pump the corner of 4093. Prior to that, the owner of the property went against my better judgment. I said to him, do not annex that in until after it is closed. And let the Canellis and Town Pump do the work. He went ahead and did it out of good faith. There was supposed to be a great sign that was going to be put there, welcome to Whitefish, and I could go on and on. The city made it extremely difficult for Town Pump. They finally said, screw them. We don't have to do that. <clears throat> I agree with, with Eric on one thing. The WBT will probably discourage most businesses. We've had the corner of 4093 South, I'm sorry, Southeast sold or at least under contract four times. It is under contract again. It's been under contract for over a year. They're deciding whether they want to do it. Mark my word, folks, 
I have people that will go county, not worry about water, won't worry about septic, and they will remind you of the Whitefish Marina. They will not be a pretty sight. We don't want to do that, but these people have made an investment on their property, and they expect some kind of return on that investment. So work with them, just like T. Bauer, just like the Canellis. Work with these people. They will work with you. But don't just cut them off at the knees, because it doesn't do any good. <clears throat> I know that if you make this decision and things don't go well, and you end up seeing things like the Whitefish Marine go in, the city of Whitefish is going to go up in arms. And I will be the first to remind them that we had, and I will give them a list of the companies that were willing to go in there, and they would love to have had them. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Anybody else wish to speak on this matter? Okay, come on up, please. Don't forget to state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Um, we are the Iversons. I'm Linda, and this is my husband, Tom. We live at 222 Iverson Lane, Whitefish, Montana. We live out by the junction, Highway 40. And uh, we just wanted to come and introduce ourselves to you. We were both born here. We were raised here. We both graduated from high school, Whitefish High School. We raised our kids here, and they all graduated from Whitefish High School. We've worked here. We've played here. We've shopped here. And we have many, many friends here. Um, Tom purchased our property in 1974. And our home was built between 1979 and 1980. And by the way, we didn't name Iverson Lane. Our neighbors, the Leets, Harold and Carol Leets, named it. Um, setting aside the easement issues, our biggest concern <coughs> excuse me, is the safety issue on entering, the highway, entering and exiting the highway at Iverson Lane. Um, we're one block south or north, excuse me, of the Highway 40 light. Um, on our meeting on January 5th of 2022 with Mr. Payne and Mr. Gromit, they stated they wanted to put in a hotel a trader, and a Trader Joe's. At our meeting with MDOT and them on February 28th of this year, which was prior to your last meeting, they stated there would already have been a Starbucks on that corner had it not been for the pandemic. Um, in our opinion, these businesses would create a lot of traffic in that area. And um, it's a huge safety issue. We're, we're pretty much able to navigate to get in and out off of Iverson Lane, but um, it's not a good it's not a good place. And the highway department has told us in the past, they're kind of, we don't know what to do with you, but they won't do anything. Um, to address the easement problems, Mr. Payne and Mr. Gromit are not willing to give us a like-kind easement, as they stated at the last meeting. They stated they had proved <clears throat> with Montana Department of Transportation that Iverson Lane cannot be used for anything other than residential only. Um, Justin Julefs from Montana Department of Transportation did say that if business traffic would be using the Iverson Lane approach, a study would have to be done. A study that would probably result in a right turn in and a right turn out only which basically is what we do most of the time now because you're taking your life in your hands if you try to do anything <laughs> else. Um, if Mr. Payne and Mr. Gromit believe they have proved our current easement would not allow us to use Iris Lane for anything other than residential traffic only, why won't they give us the same easement that we have and let us go across their property and come out at the light? I mean, if they're saying that our easement isn't any good as it is, which I have provided you guys with a copy of that easement. Um, 
At the meeting on February 28th of 2023, Mr. Gromit and Mr. Payne also said that they have two properties just to the north of us under contract. They also told Justin Julefs and us and our attorneys that if they do acquire those properties, they plan on putting a city street to the north and it would come out somewhere on Highway 93. Um, it was pointed out at that time, if a city street was put in, this would also be a non-issue because we wouldn't need an easement. We would be able to use a city street. Um, our attorney and the Wilsons who live in that same area both agree that there is no reason for them to give us an easement other than what we already have. We have not tried to tell Mr. Payne and Mr. Gromit what they can do with their property, and we do not intend to. Um, but they, Mr. Payne was pretty adamant at your last meeting that he didn't want us building this or that, uh, the storage units or a trailer park or putting a pot shop up there. We're not going to do that. We live up there. Um, there's no room up there for any of that stuff. Our house is pretty much in the middle of our property. We, um, there wouldn't be any place to put anything like that up there. We just want to live up there and, you know, we'll live without any conflict. We don't, we don't like this. Um, to be clear, it would be nice to have a road to the light, but we will continue to use Iverson's Lane if they won't give us one. Um, I don't know if you have any questions or... The only thing I'd like to add to this is we never asked for any of this. Do, Mr. Iverson, would you speak into the mic, please make sure? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, we never asked for any of this. We just, you know, we were fine the way we were. This was presented to us. And most times when you give your easement to somebody, you get a like easement. And that's not what's being offered. And so that's why we refuse. Pretty okay. much so. Okay. Thank you. Um, typically, we don't, we don't allow questions. But if anyone has questions for the Iversons, fire away. Okay. We may, we may have a question for you. Wendy, have you reviewed the, the easement? From, from the Iversons? You know, it's a private easement. We don't generally get in the middle of easements between private property owners. Okay. The city's not involved. Okay, thank you. That's okay. We didn't really expect you guys to. We just wanted to point out that there is a huge safety issue. There. Right. So. Okay, go ahead, Scott. Um, what's the width of the current easement? Leave 30 feet. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this matter? Mary Flowers, Citizens, <coughs> excuse me, for a better flood at 135 South Main in Kalispell. Uh, you have in your hearing packet our comments from the last meeting, and we ask that those be considered again. We would just like to add to that that in looking at the comparison that the planning staff has compared uh, of the allowable uses under the WB2 versus the WBT, um, we believe that there are a large number of opportunities for appropriate development in this area um, and that simply looking at this as a zone change without really looking at the cumulative impacts of traffic without having an understanding of what might occur with the PUD um, puts you in a really difficult position and I think the way um, annexations like this are handled need to provide you more information up front so that you're not in the difficult situation, which is particularly diff difficult in this one because of the um, last minute uh, disclosures by the planning director about the nature of this property. Um, 
but I think even with other annexations going forward, it's really important that you know um, if the proposed annexation is really in keeping uh, with the intent of the vision for the city. I think the changes that the council made to the um, business transitional district provides you some of those tools, but you're in a difficult position here, but we encourage you to stay with that zone. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And just for the record, we, did, we have changed our, the way that we, we, we will be able to see the zoning as we get the annexation applications. If, Thank if you. They, I, I did testify at that, but okay. I, I do think that. Um, so hopefully this won't happen. We won't be in this situation. Not in, in this future. one, but I still um, think that there are, it's problematic without more information, when you, not just the zone desired, but more information about the potential uses. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Okay, Mr. Payne, would you like to come back up and address public comment? I just I don't really want to get into a back and forth of public comment, but I would respond to a couple of statements. Again, dealing in facts, not emotions. One, the very uh, neighbor's packet that was sent in state, has the only facts that would have any statement made by me. I'm not going to get into a he said, she said, but this single uh, document that would offer any type of proof to any conversations that I've had with anyone is in that very packet. The packet state that my email states, I am thrilled to offer you a lifetime easement to that light. There is nothing I would want more for any neighbor, residential or commercial, than to give them an easement to that light. That, that is part of this whole reason that I'm here. That's a part reason we did all this, was I saw the value of that light and I didn't want to see another business going in there that is adjoining to these properties have control of that light. However, when if you read through the email, again, I stated a lifetime residential easement to the light. And that would, in, in, a, in a meeting that we've had since with attorneys involved, unfortunately, I offered a, additional leeway that it would be, a, it could be used for commercial access but it would have to be an approved access. We're not here what's going on tonight. We're, what, what the decisions made tonight and in the council meeting coming up will be issues that can, in the decision that I would make in granting an unlimited commercial access to that light through our property that we invest millions of dollars in developing to a property that is unannexed and basically uncontrolled, as you've seen on the properties to the south, could be a plethora of businesses that none of us want to see go in there. But I'm not going to, what my statement was in all of this was residential, use it forever. Your kids, your grandkids, their, their kids all have access to that light. My email clearly states that I will not grant access to unannexed properties out there that are controlled by the county because I don't want another business going in inside basically of our community. The, the comments that were made about the adjoining properties, we, our goal here is, and I have never uh, held back in this, and I would, I would be forthright and transparent, is to accumulate all the properties that we can along that corridor. I want to create a legacy incoming uh, development as you come into Whitefish that, that I'm proud of and that my daughter's proud of and that our business is proud of. I think the planning department and the building department would, would tell you everything we do, we try to do things right. We always are looking out for our neighbor. We're always looking out for our other citizens. We are not here to, to hurt anyone and look out for a quick buck. We've lived here. I've, I've raised my kids here. My daughter's going to raise her kids here. This is about a property that is going to be here long after we're all gone from the positions we're in. So yes, we are trying to accumulate other properties out there, and we will continue to do that. Our, my goal would be potentially to be all the frontage to WBC. I would love to get rid of all those entrances onto the highway 
and bring them all in through that light. There's not a person in this room that could say that is not a good idea. It would be safer, but by their very point, highly dangerous. They prove, proven their own point. It is a miserable uh, situation to try to get out on that highway without going through this light. So it proves the very point that we're all sitting here for tonight is the light is everything. It's not dangerous. It's the safest entrance for these properties of anyone on this highway corridor. It is the perfect situation and everything, the one other statement was made by the, another witness where things were not disclosed early on in, in reading through the letters. There was never a discussion about this property not being part of the growth policy. The only reason that we're all here tonight is this tiny little sliver of 1.39 acres. That's where the WBT potentially came into this conversation. If I had it to do again, I probably just would have carved the 1.39 acres off that's south of the corridor and two years ago just requested annexation. We wouldn't be, we wouldn't be going through this right now. I did everything the right way. I did everything the ethical and moral way. I was always assured under, by nobody other than the growth plan that this was part of the WB2 zoning. That's what I went by, facts. That's what I have to deal in. I'm asking you guys to put yours in ladies to put yourself in my situation where I started on this two, two plus years ago and simply make a decision based upon how you would want to be treated. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Any further public comment? Okay. We'll close the public comment period and bring it back to the board for a motion or further discussion, but I would prefer a motion. I, well, I actually, I have a quick question for Wendy. So adjacent properties to the north are all zone WB2, is that correct? No, they're in the county, and they're the B4 with the a highway still, overlay. Those yeah. are still in the county. Those yeah. have not been annexed. Correct. Where does, where does the city end? Because those are north of Highway 40, right? Yes but they just haven't been annexed, but Correct. they're in city limits. They're not in city limits. They have a county B4 zone. When, where does the city stop then? Okay. We'll have Alan bring up his GIS map. I didn't, I didn't take, see it in the It might be the, the lot to the north of that. Okay, the next Which is lot WB2 up. in the front and WA in the back. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm looking on page three of my staff report. It's like a little, I guess where the Hanks Hatchets is at. I think that's the end of the city limits. Oh, I, I guess you, you answered my question. They're still in the county. They're not actually annexed in. Correct, yet. correct. Okay. All right, further, let's, uh, we need to get a motion on the table here, guys. We need time to make a decision. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve WZC 23-02, as written and recommended by staff. Okay. Uh, Second that. Oh, just in time. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Discussion. I have, can't, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around the easement issue. If he's controlling their easement as residential only, he then controls future value and use of their property. Um, he says he doesn't want a marijuana shop back there. That's not his decision. He's con trying to control use and future use of the Iverson's property. Um, so limiting the easement to residential only um, limits their future potential. Um, and gives him the opportunity to expand onto that land before it gives other people uh, a fair market trial or opportunity. If I'm not mistaken, they still have Iverson Lane that they could use, correct? Correct. And um, so we can't condition zone changes. You know, this is just simply an annexation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I visited with the Iversons and said, you know, it's good to bring this up just so everyone is aware, but I don't think at the zone change time there's anything we can do about it. 
but it's good, I think, just to have it on the record. So, you know, if there's a subdivision or, you know, something's coming forward, we'll have that record that there's this, you know, concern and issue. Well, if, if we go ahead and grant this as B2, then Iverson's land is zoned on three sides as B2, which would be beneficial to get it zoned to that someday. However, an individual purchasing wouldn't have the access. So that's right. just my concern. And I would just point out too, on page seven of the staff report is the land use designations and their property is residential. It's suburban residential. So any um, future proposal, you know, if it, you know, sold down the road, wanted to do commercial, they would have to amend the growth policy or whatever its future name is going to be called and then come in for a zone change. So. It doesn't have the possibility of the commercial access. Why would somebody even bother with trying to get a commercial zoning designation? So I think it limits. And I think that's a question so. for the future. Yeah. Well, it really doesn't the, pertain. It's more this, just FYI, yeah. this is an issue that as we go forward, we'll be looking at. Do you like to speak to this one? Just real briefly, I think I, I think I have a good handle on this whole situation. I'm just not sure it's the role of the planning board to interfere with things like easements between private parties. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the motion in general to approve. Okay, Thank Toby. You. Okay, um, I, you know, I, uh, this one is this one is a it's a tricky one. Um, I, I look at the permitted uses. Uh, in the WB2 versus WBT and it was the it was the intent of council when we extended our services uh, that we would that we wanted to have more control over this area was the question is was this in that zone or was it just outside of the zone the timing unfortunately is is hard for me to swallow based on just the way things went down. Um, and we can, we have been burned before, unfortunately, and the number of permitted uses in the WB2 is, uh, it's too much. It's too much to grant, especially in, in my mind, at this corner, um, in this one place. Uh, and council has the ultimate say over what we zone somebody once they're annexed into the city and um, and sometimes, uh, you know, that's, you just have to accept what you get. And that's, I, I think that's pretty well, um, I think that's pretty well laid out in the way that, in the annexation process and in the way that we are allowed, what we're allowed to do when we do annex in a property. Um, is the WBT maybe not permissive enough in this area? for what Mr. Payne would like to do. Maybe not, um, but I can't, I don't see any of the conditional uses in here that he could apply for that would be ones that are drastically different from the, from the permitted uses he mentioned in, um, in the WBT, WB2, excuse me. But there are several, and this was the conversation that the council had during the, during the adoption of the WBT, that we wanted to take out because we, because it is not the 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 people in our city don't want to see that. It's part of our corridor plan, to that we don't. There are certain things we don't want to see in that corridor, um, and that. So for that reason, I I can't support Toby's motion tonight. Further comment. Okay, then let's vote. Those in favor, uh, and again, the, the motion is to, uh, to uh, approve the, the, pack, the staff report as written, which would be to rezone this as WB2. So those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, like, uh, like sign. Motion fails three to two. So Mr. Payne, this will go to council still uh, with a recommendation to um, with, without a recommendation, how does this work now? So I did offer some findings of fact that you could adopt um, okay. to support the WBT. 
that would so take a separate motion. you could certainly make a motion to approve WBT and it's W, uh, which one, WCR. So it's both. Okay. Because there's a little bit of residential in this okay. annexation. Okay. Does somebody like to make that motion? Hang on, let's, let me ask, let's let Toby ask his question first. Go ahead, Toby. You're up. Mike, Mike, please. I said I misunderstood the uh, entire reading. <clears throat> we can make an amendment per staff's recommendation to zone it WZ. Yes. So, well, well the, the motion to zone it WB2 failed. So now we need a, a, no, a separate motion to adopt this separate findings of fact. I just have to find it real quick. Okay. You want to make uh, it with so you? I will make a motion to um, approve the WZC 23-02 with the findings of fact identified by Wendy to give the property the zoning of the WBT and the WCR. I believe it and adopt those findings of fact? And adopt, yeah, and adopt Wendy's finding of fact, yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion on that? Okay, those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, sign. Okay, motion passes four to one with uh, Middleton in opposition. Okay, uh, we have uh, two more Public hearings tonight, the next one is WCUP 23-03, a request by Goose Bay Capital for a renewal conditional use permit for Bar Tavern um, at 6185 Highway 93 South. This one is Nelson. So this is, <clears throat> this application is to renew a previously approved conditional use permit uh, that has since expired. Um, WCUP 20-05 was approved on May 4, 2020 and expired November 4, 2021. Um, since then, the property has newly constructed car wash and a coffee shop. Um, and then the, the tavern where the conditional use permit would be um, applied is um, 6185 Highway 93 South, which is currently the empty building. So they are applying for a conditional, use, a conditional use permit for a bar slash tavern. And the, the reason, th this is a little different than a um, restaurant um, beer and wine license. They're proposing to transfer um, the, a Montana beer and wine license. Um, and what this would allow them to do would be to serve alcohol only and not have to serve it along with food. The, the surrounding area is again um, WB2, um, and there's some residential to the east of the property. Uh, and then in the gold policy designation is general commercial for the property. I mailed a notice um, to adjacent land notice 300 feet from the property on March 31st, um, published a a notice in the pilot on the 5th, and I received one public comment in support that I attached to the packet. So I'm going to go over some of the, the, the findings. Um, growth policy compliance. Um, it complies with the growth policy designation of general commercial because the property has been developed in accordance with the WB2 zoning, and no change to the property um, is proposed with the application. As far as the compliance with regulations, complies with all the zoning regulations um, because all the zoning standards have been met um, or will be met with conditions of approval and um, they already received a building permit so everything um, as far as the zoning regulations have already been reviewed. For site suitability um, there's adequate usable land area um, because they don't need to develop anything else it's for an existing building 
and there's no environmental or emergency um, restraints. As far as functionality and quality, um, the applicant has effectively dealt with the site and design issues as they're providing the required amount of parking, um, traffic circulation will be unchanged, and the property complies with the current lands landscaping requirements. Um, for city services, public services facilities are adequate and available, and there is no anticipated um, negative impact from, to the neighborhood from noise, dust, smoke, or other environmental nu nuisances. Um, and again, for neighborhood compatibility, it's compatible with the neighborhood. Um, this existing building is not proposed to change in size. Any future exterior, exterior changes would have to go through architectural review. Um, the existing neighborhood is a mixture of commercial and residential uses, including existing bar, restaurant, and casino next door. Um, and so the, and the project appears compatible with the surrounding community character. So it was recommended that the Whitefish Planning Board adopt the findings of fact within Staff Report WCUP 23-03 that this conditional use permit be recommended for approval to this Whitefish City Council subject to the following conditions. Um, you know, the standard uh, needs to be in compliance with the, with the submission uh, from that they submitted on February 24th. The applicant must maintain and demonstrate continued compliance with all adopted city codes and ordinances. Um, the applicant must provide a minimum of two locking bicycle racks as close to the existing building as possible. And again, the conditional use permit is valid for 18 months and shall terminate unless commencement of the activity has begun. Okay, thanks Nelson. Any questions from Nelson? Just to, just to clarify, this, is, this was already approved in 2020 and we're just reapproving it essentially. That's Correct. what you're asking. The, yep, this is a new application for essentially it's the exact same thing that was approved. Mm -hmm. Essentially the exact same thing or the exact same thing? The, yeah, this exact same thing. The only okay. thing that changes is that they've you know, built, they've developed a lot further. I guess. The okay. only difference is the building's now built. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, none, of the, none of the conditions have changed or anything. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for staff? Okay. So uh, let's open it for the public comment then. Anybody here to speak on this matter? Come on up. Is it, you're, Okay. Does anybody have any questions for the applicant? Okay. We're going to let him off easy tonight. Uh, okay. We'll close the public comment and ask the board for a motion, please. I'll make a motion to approval of WCUP 23-03 as written with the three, four conditions of staff. Okay. It's moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor, raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. That one passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, and we're off to our last public hearing of the night, WZTA 23-03, a request by the City of Whitefish to amend Chapter 4, Landscaping Requirements, Chapter 3, Sections 11-3-42, Multi-Family Development Standards, and a whole host of other things. Uh, this would be Alan. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair, hang on, Wendy is starting up the screen. I was waiting to see how quickly you could run through all of those proposals. <clears throat> Almost up here. Do I have my mic on? Can you hear me? There it is. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is the proposed landscape code update. I'm going to sort of run through the same presentation since this is a formal hearing and there could be people streaming online or for the record. Uh, the last time any revisions occurred were in 2008. Updates to the landscape code have been discussed by council since at least 2017. They were subsequently listed as a 2022 city council goal. What is being proposed today is a significant change from the existing code. <clears throat> so the process was that staff review the landscaping regulations for seven uh, Montana municipalities, six cities in the Northwest, 
Five city and county governments in Colorado and several other cities with robust landscape regulations such as Savannah, Georgia, and Myrtle Beach. <clears throat> Staff reviewed the existing regulations. We reconstructed and rewrote them and had five different internal meetings with various departments, including Parks and Recs and Public Works. Staff then sent the draft to 12 landscape firms and arborists familiar with the city of Whitefish and Montana flora for review and comment. We were able to make all of the changes, which were all minor. Staff brought this to the Planning Board and City Council during work sessions in February of this year, and overall, they were the, it was favorable. There were just a few comments, which I will talk about shortly. So we did not provide actual red mark copies. You have like an entire red mark new section and then an entire crossed out old section because it's just so much it wouldn't be helpful to you to try to do track changes. Uh, the code was completely rearranged to make it flow and read more logically. The basic landscaping requirements were reorganized into tables at the front so they could be easier to find. Uh, the new landscape requirements apply to everything except for single-family detached, where the current code exempts single-family detached at duplexes and triplexes. So it applies to everything except for single-family residential. New requirements for residential buffer. There's new requirements for residential buffers, street frontages, and internal parking lot islands. Uh, it adds a. I put a 30. It adds a 30-foot buffer along US 93 south of uh, south of 13th. That's what's recommended in the in the corridor plan. So that's been added to this landscape code. Uh, there are details regarding what's the required of a landscape plan. There's almost no information now. It just says a site plan. It doesn't really have any requirements. There's pretty robust requirements now. There's descriptions and requirements for a percentage of the landscaping to be drought tolerant and native to Montana, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, there's requirements based on new standards, which are length of frontages, sizes of parking lots versus what is existing. There's a table with some square footages, and nobody knows exactly where those square footages come from. They don't even correlate to anything, so we're not sure how we came, how, where that came from. So now it's based on performance standards. Uh, we moved existing landscape requirements of other sections into the code, into this code. Uh, some of those existing sections were the off-street parking and loading had a whole landscape section, which is now gone. That's one of the revisions that you'll see included in your packet that's been moved into this. We looked at things that were duplicative and took those out, obviously. Uh, Multifamily standards, there were some landscape standards in there that came in. Mixed use and non-residential. And then there's sp some specific standards, mostly talking about what we at the time called a green belt. Uh, and that was in WB2, WB3. Uh, WRB1 and WRB2. Uh, the existing code, if you've ever tried to figure it out, has a minimum tree density requirements with these difficult tables, numbers, and calculations, calculations which are very difficult to figure out, and usually staff would just ask the landscape architects to figure it out for us. Staff preferred a simpler approach to this, and they, we reviewed tree preservation requirements for more than 20 municipalities. Uh, the new requirements that we have now identify evergreen trees with calipers greater than 12 inches and deciduous trees greater than 6 inches and trees that are determined uh, that are significant by the zoning administrator. So maybe they're associated with a place or event or something like that. Like maybe it's not one of these trees, but it was associated with something particular. Those are being called qualifying trees. Each qualifying tree removed uh, needs to be replaced with trees totaling at least two times the caliper inches as what was lost. Take one out, you've got to replace two. Each existing preserved qualifying tree shall be credited as two trees towards the satisfying the landscaping requirement, except that you can't, uh, you can't do more than 50% 50, 50 of the credit. So you can't save all, you can't, yeah. Uh, there's also a, an allowance for re, uh, relief from this requirement, which I'll talk about in a second because that's changed slightly. As mentioned before, because the new landscape code includes merging existing requirements in from other sections, if some of this code is updated, other sections should be updated accordingly. Uh, that, those sections have all been included in your staff report, and you've gotten uh, red mark sections of all that is, as well. So all those should be also incorporated. The majority of this includes deleting landscape requirements from other code sections that were being moved in. Some code sections that have been changed just reference this new landscape code. Subsequently, uh, as I said, I've, you've, this, there's all that new code is also accompanying the staff report. Staff brought this proposed regulatory update to the Planning Board and the City Council in February. Overall, as I said, they were both very supportive of this. There was a few comments. Uh, there were questions about how tree valuation would be determined, and there was a, uh, a manual that we talked about. 
And there was a comment about whether or not we could include pages of that mantle to kind of figure out how the tree valuation would occur. And I talked to the city arborist about that. And their response was, it wouldn't be very helpful because this manual is more of formulas and calculations. It says if you have this kind of tree at this age, then you apply all these formulas, and these formulas say how much of a full tree this is worth. Um, she's not here tonight. She did come to the work session for city council to discuss that. Um, the, the, the planning board was supportive of the tree preservation and the council, but they believe there should be some exemptions for fire mitigation, which was a really good point. I think we've addressed that. There was a council person that suggested that there be additional clarification regarding what an acceptable root bearer is. Um, I already talked to the city arborist. We talked to the landscape architects. We have included that in the new code. I can show you what that is if you want to see it. It basically just talks about something that's impermeable for the life of the tree. That's what the arborist recommended. Uh, council person directed staff to make a res uh, res revision to the residential buffer standards to require a residential buffer to have a 50% visual screen at least five feet in height. We did that. It says it'd be a five foot high at maturity. There was, a, there was two comments from the public I thought I would just address. One of them was about uh, how difficult it could be sometimes to get 50% of it being native species. That was actually the same thing I heard from landscape architects. There is a requirement in the, or there is an allowance in there for cultivars, which are basically sort of a genetically modified uh, native. So if you can't get a native species, you can include cultivars. And that was, again, what was recommended by landscape architects, which I believe is reasonable. Uh, there was a comment about there should be about there being a footnote added to the code so people could see how uh, expensive a replacement tree was. And we didn't do that, first of all, because the prices can just change, as you've seen just over the last couple of years, how prices have gone all over the place. Secondly, we're not real thrilled about putting a cost into a municipal code, because then you have to do a complete code update in order to change that cost. So it, we could do a worksheet, or we could provide some of the information, but actually putting a cost in code, especially since this last one was done in 2007, would be a really bad idea. So as I said, we, we did all that clarification. Uh, we added the cultivars. I, didn't, I, I think I've described all this. The one thing about the tree retention, again, there were some comments about fire mitigation. The previous version said that the zoning administrator had to basically do an approval similar to a variance. So there was these very specific findings you had to make in order to not have to do the tree replacement requirements. Uh, we, we talked about that, and that would determine that would probably be tough because it could be quite possibly that the zoning administrator would be having to process these variances for every single landscape plan. There's some language in the new code uh, that talks about that the city under, I'm just kind of paraphrasing it, but it says that the city recognizes that sometimes tree, re, uh, tree removal is necessary for things like fire mitigation. Um, that, that uh, there has to be, that a landscape plan, when you submit your landscape plan, you have to show the trees that are being preserved, the trees are being retained, and which ones are being replaced. And if you can't do it, basically, you have to rationalize why it's not feasible. And you can't just use, like, why well, I can't develop to the highest intensity or, or density or something like that. You have to actually demonstrate on your landscape plan that you've tried to design your, your plan, and it's not reasonable development to be able to design and keep those trees. And certainly fire mitigation, if you have to do fire-wise and take your trees out, per what the, the fire marshal says, that would certainly be one of the reasons as well. Uh, there, there, was, there was one more thing that occurred. We, if your earlier version of the code, there was a requirement for perimeter landscaping around buildings. And this actually ended up being one of the, probably the tougher part. Um, the, this came because the uh, fire chief had issues about having perimeter landscaping directly around buildings. Uh, and apparently there is some movie going around which will show, I guess, like a rake sitting up against a building, catching fire and setting the whole building on fire. Uh, so, so he had concerns about that. Uh, we talked about the way that we could uh, approach that. Uh, there's already some language in the code that we just strengthened up a little bit, but basically what it just says now, instead of having a building perimeter landscaping requirement, it says that you have to landscape along the frontages of the buildings. So you can, you can landscape along the street, you can landscape directly along the building, but it gives you that flexibility that you don't have to do it at the perimeter of the building, you just have to provide some landscaping in between the street and the building. Uh, I talked to the fire chief about that, he was fine with that. Um, with that, do you want me to read this entire thing, or? Word, word for word, please. <laughs> Just kidding. Just so, kidding. So I'm recommending that the Whitefish Planning Board recommend approval to the City Council of the new landscape code 
um, along with all of these supporting sections of code that would be required in order to do that. Um, and that's it, in case you have any questions. Okay, any questions for Alan? Yeah, go ahead. Whitney. So maybe I understood or misunderstood you when you were talking about the fire hazard and being able to say the reason these trees were removed is for fire prevention. Is that something that will flag the fire marshal and he then has to say, yes, that makes sense, these trees were removed for that reason? Or it's just this is some reason that you might say you removed more trees? <laughs> so uh, Wendy does current planning, so she might have a, a better answer about the way that the review process works, but you would have to submit a landscape plan. That landscape plan is also going to have to go to engineering. I would believe that the fire marshal, fire chief, would look at the landscaping plan. We would ask the fire chief, is this true? Do they have to take these trees out, or is, is this just malarkey? So, okay. yeah, you have to be accountable. You just can't say, I don't want to put these trees in. You have to be able to demonstrate why you can't do it. Okay, thank you. And any other questions for Alan? Uh, my only question, and it was one that came up before, is um, having, having to replace non-native trees. So if you have, so if we have non-native or pest trees, so may, maybe you have two apple trees on your prop property and you take them out, is there an exemption so that you don't have to replace trees when you take out a pest species like apples? It doesn't specifically talk about pest trees, but again, that's why we sort of added some flexibility in that you could make that argument. If you've got some eucalyptus, I don't know, we don't have eucalyptus here, but if you had a tree that was an obnoxious tree and you didn't want to replace it, or you wanted to maybe um, replace it with a different tree, you could demonstrate that on your landscape plan. That's why we wrote it the way that we did. Okay. So there's, there's, there's just no way that there, you can't write this stuff so tight that there can't be any flexibility. There has to be some kind of reasonable flexibility. Okay. Thank you. Um, this, we did advertise this for a public hearing. If there's anybody who wishes to speak on this matter, there's nobody here, so we will close the public hearing and ask the board for a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve staff report WZTA 23-03 as written and with all the modifications they recommended. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, those in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, like sign, but passes unanimously. We're off on to good and welfare, matters from the board. Any matters from the planning board for staff? Um, well, I have one. I heard that it is Kenny's last night with us because she is retiring and uh, Personally, I would like to thank you, Kenny, for all of the hard work you've done for us over the years. It's been quite a few now <laughs> for, uh, for all of us. Um, so thank you, Kenny. We certainly appreciate all of your, all of your work. She's mad at me for all this code that I just gave her. Like, like I just gave her a whole stack of stuff she had to do. She's oh, no. Her last thing. Okay. <laughs> well, you can now. Uh, <laughs> okay. Any other matters from the board? Next month, okay, uh, that'll be, that's the last known. Uh, we'll do that right at the end. Matters from staff, anything? When, do we have an idea of when our next uh, work session will be? <clears throat> um, probably not in May. Um, we'll let you know, you know, on the agenda when we are ready for something. Okay. You know, right, we're gonna be responding in May to what the legislature does and what the governor signs into law and we'll have to evaluate how that affects the growth policy update and if we're gonna have to drop some of that to make some zone changes and things like that to accommodate some of the new legislation and so okay. it's kind of might take a little while you know maybe june we would have one i would think okay. it's a possibility well i won't i don't think i'll be here for the june meeting but hopefully if we have the website up by june that could at least be a discussion item as the engagement site okay yeah, and there may and maybe times where we just do it at 5 45 if it's just a quick update or something right instead of starting at five okay. one of the things that we have talked about if we are going to have you guys in at five that we might try to provide pizza or some other food you guys, that would, that if it's going to be a long nice. meeting. If there's nothing else on the agenda, then you know you might get out of here by six o'clock or something. But sure. um, okay. But certainly, you guys, you know, don't get a lot of big bucks for your volunteer roles, and so it's nice <laughs> to feed you guys once in a while. Uh, okay. Speaking of big bucks, I do want to let you all be the first group to know that I did today file for 
re-election to city council. So I will be running again um, for city council in the November election. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, anything else from staff? Okay, great. Poll of board members available for May 18th. Anybody know you're not going to be here on the 18th of May? You won't be, Scott. So we'll need to check with Chris and uh, Allison so that we can have a quorum. Yeah, there will be a couple of items on that agenda for sure. So okay. the corridor multifamily housing project and a PUD amendment for uh, 95 Caro, the yards. Okay, great. Um, so we will, so someone from planning will reach out to the other um, members and make sure that we're going to have a quorum, please. Thank you. Uh, and with that, motion to adjourn. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.